they're all just in. How's it going, party people? All right. Uh, hello, guys. Welcome back. It's Tuesday. We have a lecture. Um, I'm going to get started in a second. All right. Um, I'll do the course participation in a few minutes. Just give everyone some time to get into the room. All right, so um, so last week was our first week. I kind of just gave the motivation, the layout of the course, and then I started to introduce our first topic, which was the Set UID Lab. We started to discuss a few things. Remember, this is a course on software assurance, both for quality and security. So right now, um, the first four to five weeks, we're going to be doing a series of um, labs, you know, discussing where all of these labs are really part of the same concept. So it was really one topic that we're covering uh, security at C um, and C, C, C++ level related to, to memory, basically, and how, ex, you know, how usual exploits work. Uh, in particular, the ones that are, you know, buffer overflow based. So um, the, the first two labs that we do in, in this class, which is the set UID lab and the format string lab are really kind of, they, they go together. So they're really like one single thing that we're looking at. I know it's new, a lot of things are new. So uh, I will help you out on Thursday by giving you more information. Um, I've right now I'm just kind of laying, uh, you know, kind of laying out all the topics for both of them, for format string and for set UID. Okay, so I'm really kind of just discussing them, and then hopefully on, uh, you know, on on Thursday we'll start uh, finishing up. Uh, those two labs. Okay, so I think, you know, uh, I think everyone's in right now. So let me just get this out of the way and I'll, I'll take a picture for the course participation here. So I think this is the last week that I have to do this. All right, okay, so now let's go ahead and share a whiteboard. So you should be seeing the whiteboard. Okay, so as I said, what we're trying to do is we're, we're exploiting, we're looking at exploits, right? We're looking at exploits. So I kind of gave you the idea that when you took uh, your previous classes, you use Metasploit or something along those lines, right? And then you had like a Windows server usually, and then you had your laptop, you had your laptop. And so what you would do is you would, you know, go to the laptop server computer and you would select something, you know, a vulnerability, um, and then you would launch an attack via the network. This server had a process, a daemon running in the background, and you would basically connect to that port that was listening on there. This process was written in C, C++, for instance, Right, and when you had that input going in, that that usually got stored in variables in memory, right? It gets stored in memory because it's code, you know, there's usually variables involved. And so the problem is the way that the variables were created has vulnerabilities, right? That's what this class is about, is understanding those ideas. And so then therefore the, the attacker here just needs to craft an input. 
a particular type of an input called a code injection. Okay, the goal will be to send that, right, send that through that port that's open and it goes into the program itself, into variables, and then maybe there's this variable over here, right, that should have ended there, but the way the code is written, the, this code injection will actually end up taking up that space in memory, which is the right thing, plus additional space in memory. Maybe all of this space in memory in this one. And that was unintended. Do you guys see that, guys? And now if you think about it, the program, by the way, was pointing to that. And that's an important um, Letting some people in. That was an important value that the program needs to use. And guess what? What did your code injection do? It overtook it as well. Do you guys get the basic idea? This is in essence what we are doing. Okay. And you know, it, it, there's a lot of jargon and complication that, you know, this and that, but ultimately that's what we are doing. Um, that's all we're doing is we're trying to, you know, again, we have spaces in memory where variables are stored, right? And we are trying to put data in it. Now, we don't want to put, sometimes we want to put some data air, there that's just gibberish. And if we do that, and if it's just gif, gibberish, we're going to have a software assurance because of quality, right? You know, the, 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 the real data that was supposed to be in there has been overwritten, so the program may crash. But we can actually do more than that. We can actually, if we know how the programs work, we can actually, because we're creating this code injection, we can put specific values in there that we want. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, it does. Okay. And that's exactly, that is literally what we are doing in the set UID lab, in the format string lab, in the buffer overflow labs is the basic principle. Okay. So the set UID lab, I talked about the set UID command last week, and that's really just so that we can, again, we run a program with the privileges of the owner. We talked about effective ID and real ID. And so the goal is that from a process, we want to spawn another process and hopefully retrain, retain the privileges. Okay, that's what we learned uh, last week. It's about getting the, the a terminal, getting, you know, getting something, but, but ultimately retaining that effective ID. That's you know, what it comes down to it. This week, format string lab, uh, it's not so much about, oh, let's, let's learn about format strings or let's learn about the format string vulnerability and exploit that. In my opinion, the format string is about the concepts behind it, okay? Because this is the lab where we are now going to play with memory. So what you guys will be doing in, in this lab this week is really just playing, playing with memory directly. You know, how can we, we're going to have, so, so let me uh, move over here. Now format string. Format string lab or format string concept really is really about memory. Okay, because we know that there's variables in memory and now we want to do at least three things. And they're in ever increasing degree of complexity, right? The first one is crash the program. That's pretty, you know, that's the easiest because just put in some random data there. Next one is read something in memory. And the third one is 
right memory. And that's the most dangerous. So in, 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 in this time around, when we're writing to memory, we're going to write something very basic. Next set of labs, we will write something more complex, OK? But it's really important that you understand this idea that format string lab is really about memory. Try to understand that. OK, uh, so now you might just say, well, I'm just going to write a C code that uh, accesses the variables. Well, there's one caveat. There's one, you know, uh, condition here, and that is that we can't interact with source code. The source code is not accessible. We cannot. We can. I mean, we can. We can study that. So you can make this assumption. You know, you are you were a disgruntled employee at Microsoft. You took a picture of the code and you took it home. So you have all the code. You can read it. You can read it. You know how they write data structures, variables. You know everything. But what you can't do is modify the code and insert it back into Microsoft, right? The moment you left Microsoft, you're off uh, all systems. So you, can't, you can never write source code and replace it in their source and, and, and insert a vulnerability like that. That's not possible. The only thing that's possible is that you do know what the code looks like. You read it, you were a programmer at Microsoft, and now you know that Microsoft has products like Windows, for instance, right? And Windows will have inputs, right? Which are, you know, the port numbers, ports, right? So on your computer, at any time, there might be a few ports open uh, for various daemons that are running. And so you know, so these are the tools that you have. You were a programmer. You know, you actually wrote some of that code. You, you took pictures of all of it. You read it. You understand it. But now, what do you need to do? You need to check the code and look for vulnerabilities. For instance, you know that this daemon has a port number. And when it receives an input, it doesn't do a good job of, of protecting it while it's stored in memory. And so you're like, huh, OK, there's a vulnerability there because that place in memory is not um, well, well um, declared. There's the variables associated with that are not well established, they're not very secure, there's no input validation. So wouldn't it be nice? So this is just an example, but if I could write x30 xb in there, let's just say for the sake of argument, you write that and then the CPU will eventually read there and it'll just you know delete the whole program. For instance, it's just an example. So then you know that, you know that the, this port number is associated with that space and variable. So all you have to do then is craft x30 xb. That's your, what is called a code injection. You have to find a way to send it through the port, which will end up writing it in memory. And when you do that, it, you, you, you succeed it. You see that? That's the basic idea, OK? And so that's what we're going to do today. So it's going to take a little bit of uh, discussing. There's more information on this lab than on the Set UID lab. Um, I've posted the uh, the labs on Blackboard. Uh, the the so in the Seed Labs, it's actually doing two things: uh, um, scope variables, I think, and format string. So the lab actually includes two topics. We are only going to do the format string topic for now. We might come back to the other one later. But for one, for now, I'm, so I, I've included actually two labs in there, one that is more specific to the format string, one that includes the variable scope. But they're pretty much the same lab. That's what I want you to, to understand. And so that's why for these, usually I just give you the PDF for the seed labs. But for these, I've actually written out some Word documents. So you really only, and I've had this question a couple of times already, 
you only for the seat for this two labs, these two labs, uh, set UID and format string, you only need to do the questions in the Word documents. Okay, that, that should cover enough of, of the topics that we are trying without getting into too much of uh, repetitiveness. Uh, we'll, we'll do the buffer overflow part in the next couple of labs. Okay? So this is the general idea. Um, are there any questions about this before I go into the actual details of the format string? Are there any questions at this time? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, for, so for the uh, set UID uh, lab, all we have to worry about is answering those questions on that Word document, right? The Word document, but answering those questions needs, you need to do certain things, right? You need to, one is, yes. I know one is very easy, it's just, just like compile this program, but other ones, there's one problem basically that you need to solve. Okay, okay. That's Does that answer your question, Susan? Yes, that's, that's all I had. Yeah, and also on Thursday, what I'm gonna do is, um, you know, we can go through both labs at the same time, okay? They're kind of related in a sense, okay? Okay. Yeah. If you have additional questions about something, we can work through the details. But today, I, I just want to lay out the, the framework for format string, okay? This one is, as I said, there's, there's a little bit more to it in terms of Any other questions? All right, so if there's no questions, let's get started with it then. All right, so format string, as I said, the key idea with format string is memory. So before set UID, the main idea with set UID is a process Right? You have, you know, have a process ID, right? You have process IDs. You've seen that in Linux. So we have a process. Process ID is running. This process is associated with, for access control, with real ID, real ID, effective ID. Okay? And so we are really just exploring that. Exploring ownership of set UID and, and all of that. And then can we access a file? How do we access a file? Etc. How does the mechanism work? This one is a little bit more complex because now you are actually trying to do things that, that you shouldn't be doing. Okay, we should not be doing, uh, you know, we, we should access memory through C code, but we should not, if a program is running, we should not intentionally insert inputs and get to modify or, or have access to the RAM memory, right? That's not something that should happen. But that's really what format string is. A format string is really like a lightweight buffer overflow lab. Because over, buffer overflow actually needs the two previous um, concepts, um, you know, format string and set. So today we're laying out format string and format string has to do with, you know, own, I should say memory. Memory. Okay. Um, it also has to do with a program. So imagine you run a program, run uh, my prog dot exe. So this is a program written in C, just like a daemon could be. The program runs, and then it starts prompting you for things, enter data, right? And so you now have the opportunity to write whatever you want in here. And if the program doesn't do any input validation, and if the program is badly written inside, that can lead to bad things because literally what you can insert here is literally any possible character available on a computer, including not just the ASCII characters, but hexadecimal, 
values, etc. And in certain types of programs, certain type of types of programs may actually get parameters, certain parameters. And so those parameters actually can be commands to execute uh, certain uh, tasks in, behind the scenes. Okay, and so that's another thing. So, so these are the elements of the format Streamlab is the discussion on memory and the idea that we have a, an executable program that we are running and we're going to enter some data in it. Okay, so that's really what we're focusing on now. So given that we're talking about memory, Given that we are talking about memory, that's what we're going to discuss uh, in, 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 you know, in this um, next, right? So we're going to discuss this now. So the, the, we, we probably need to ask a question. Remember, again, we're talking about in the context of C, C++, you know, in our Linux Ubuntu uh, VM, right? So we're talking about that structure in Linux, okay? So the, the question we want to ask is, how are programs, programs, any C code that you write, how are programs laid out in memory? So how is it that all of these programs are laid out in memory, right? We know that they are stored in memory. We know that they get stored. And so that takes us, we have to have this idea, right? We have to have this idea of memory. And you can just think of memory as a long variable or a long space that has addresses, right? So there's addresses associated with it. And then when the operating system is, uh, uh, you know, lay laying out everything, it divides memory into certain areas, right? We have certain areas for specific, uh, specific things. So imagine all of this is memory, okay? And now we have certain areas that have specific names. So for instance, I'm gonna call this area a stack, okay? Now you guys have done data structures and you know that uh, we have queues and stacks, right? Do you remember the uh, how is data? entered and retrieved from a stack? What was the... Do you mean like first in, last out? First in, first out is a queue, first correct? In, oh. So what is the stack? LIFO, right? What does that stand for? Yeah. Last in, last out. Last in, first out. Like a stack of books. Put a stack of books on your... Uh, Table, right, you're stacking them. Uh, so the last in is the first one out, right, and so on. All right, so that's important actually. I, I say this, but that's important because that data structure, uh, it, that area in memory called a stack uses that data structure because of the way that uh, we need to, the way the program is written, the data is gonna be stacked like that, last in, first out. There's going to be other areas in memory. One is going to be called a heap. Okay. Then we're going to have another area in memory. We're going to call this one uninitialized data. Uninitialized data. Okay, that's another area in memory. We have yet another one called initialized data. Initialized data. All right, we got another one called text. And that's the main idea, right? So the main idea is on a computer, on any day, your, your Ubuntu you know, machine has, um, it has it places in memory that have specific names. And this, you know, so what is, what, why do we need that? We need that because as you write code 
and you create functions, you, the functions have various, uh, uh, or code are different. They have different types of variables, you know, and, uh, and so they need to have certain areas that have certain algorithms that are more efficient for that area, okay? So for instance, sometimes uh, you declare variables and you only declare them as int x, correct? Let's say in, in, uh, we're assuming C, C++ here. So what, what do you think? If you declare a variable as int x, where would you think you could put it? In which area in memory? I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> so if I have a variable x. Initialized data? Huh? Is it an initialized data? Uninitialized, right? Very good. Excellent. Good job. Uninitialized data. What about if I have, and, and remember, this is really just a program. So I, you know, go ahead, open up, uh, you know, GCC, write some C code. You're declaring variables, and, and maybe you've never thought about it, but, but the, the way that you declare the variables determines where these, where these variables are going to go in memory. Now remember that an attacker, what an attacker wants to do, going back to this, is they want to get to that place in memory where the CPU will read that as an instruction. So the first thing an attacker needs to know, our disgruntled employee is, okay, I need to go to this area in memory. Which variables in my code will be closest to that? You know, that, that's kind of the idea. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Okay, excellent. So then if I have another one, for instance, I have int uh, y equal 10, then that one would go to initialize data because this one was initialized. And so it's been, you know, it's more efficient to put it there. Um, if I have code in assembly, for instance, code in assembly, which you guys know, we'll be looking at some of that because as you know, if you're inserting code, remember, remember that when you're inserting code in these areas, it's no longer the high level programming language that we understand in program. Remember that C is a, is a compiled language, so it's converted to machine code. So we need to write the code injections in that language, in the translated language. Okay, so, you know, assembly code could be located in the text area. Now, you, you possibly know this. You, I, I'm sure you did this in C at some point. What type of data goes in the heap? Let's see if you guys know this one. What type of data goes there? Dynamically allocated data. Do you remember that concept from C, C++? What is dynamically allocated data? It's kind of the data that you haven't defined the size that, you know, uh, you maybe you remember the function malloc. Malloc, right? So these types of functions that allow you to define, not, you know, dynamically, the variable that you're going to use. And so for that type of variable that is not specified, you have an area called the heap. Maybe this heap needs to be a little bit more robust with its algorithms because anything that's dynamically allocated, you know, can result in problems, right? And so, because it, yes, the program is running, there's going to be changes, so on. And that leaves the stack. Let me write LIFO here. So what about the stack? What kind of data goes in here? Anyone know? So in the stack, we have <clears throat> function related data. <laughs> 
when I when I say function, I mean you know any function, right? So you know uh, in C int <coughs> my function arguments open curly bracket close curly bracket you know, int y equals zero and so on. You guys see this, right? And remember functions. Oops. What do functions do? They return. <laughs> so when I say function related data, I mean whenever in a, in a program, in a C program, you write a function. This, this guys is really important, okay? This is really important. Uh, whenever you write a program in C, C++, and the program has a function, that data gets stored in the stack. <laughs> and the stack area of memory is, is, is an especially interesting area because of the mechanism and how it works, right? So you know that a function is, you know, we have these function calls. So you have a program, you're running some code, then you have a function call. You have to go create a space in memory for that function. Then you need to return to the next instruction and so on to execute the program. So you can see how you have a flow from, a, from code to code. And in between, you, go, you have a function call. And so you can see how that might be of interest, you know, some, something that left the code to execute some other code and then it's gonna come back might be of interest, okay? And so when you're uh, trying to hack something, functions are an especially interesting target that you might wanna take a look at. So for the next two, three weeks, we're gonna be spending a lot of time talking about the stack and talking about functions in particular, okay? So that's really, now my goal is not really to uh, just, you know, we're not going to get into all the details of this. I mean, you can always pursue it on your own later if you become a, you know, this type of a exploit engineer, but I definitely want you to understand the, the overall idea. Okay. And I think the labs. Okay. okay. So let's continue. So as we have, uh, we have learned then we have, you know, memory. This is called memory allocation. Okay, memory allocation, right? And you have certain segments here. You have the heap, and you have over here the stack, right? You have that. Now, when you have, you're going to have a CPU. A lot of the time, you have the CPU. There's other places in memory. CPUs have these things called registers that have individual names. And these registers sometimes are basically pointers where they have addresses to places in memory, okay? And so that's, you know, what, they're, what the CPU is doing with these registers is it's keeping track of its current location in memory. Sometimes these are called stack pointers because they're pointing to the place in memory where the stack is located. Okay, well, that's the idea there. Now, the, so, so if you're, uh, you know, trying to, somebody trying to exploit things, you want to figure out how to get the CPU to move around memory to move in the stack, to read instructions that it wasn't supposed to do. And sometimes what could happen is that the stack pointer might actually just be pointing to another place in memory that holds an address because memory can hold data, but it also holds addresses, okay? And so really now you have a mechanism because you're thinking, huh, maybe I can't change the address on the CPU but sometimes the CPU has registers pointing to memory itself, which are addresses to other places in memory. Do you see that? 
Now, if there's a variable here, right, that is an input from a program, let's say you have a program, myprog.exe, and it has a variable which is that variable over there, and it's got an input which is not properly validated, you could maybe put a code injection overwrite this. You see that, guys? But if there aren't proper checks, maybe you can overwrite this and keep overwriting and overwriting and overwriting and guess what? Overwrite the address. So here you can do two things. You can either destroy that address, create gibberish, have the program crash, or let's say this is uh, four bytes of code injection, craft a code injection of four bytes where the fourth byte is a new address. So if you overwrite that address with your own new address, oops, oh. So if you overwrite that address with your own address now, or your own, let's say X, now that address jumps to some other place in memory. Do you see that? Again, I will repeat this concept a lot. Don't worry about it. But in essence, that's the idea. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. So uh, again, I will repeat this quite a bit. But we're going to look at it today from a very simple point of view. Are there any questions so far, guys? No. Everything clear? All right. Let's keep going. Okay. Okay, so now. Um, all right, so now let's, let's think of even more, a more, a more concrete example. We got the stack there, right? Remember it's memory. So I'm going to have a little program to avoid function and it's going to be arg1 arc two, arc three, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. And then here we're gonna say, you know, char local one, or kind of a little buffer, int lock two, like that, right? So we got two variables and some arguments. These, remember, these are called arguments usually. And these are the local variables. So now, this is a function. This is a function. Because it's a function, because it functions get processed in a specific way, a function should go in what part of memory? Stack. Which one? Stack. The stack. Okay, good. So when you say that, you know immediately one thing. Ah, a CPU has a register called the stack pointer. So in turn, so it's like it's relative, right? So in terms of things being relative, you know immediately. This program has a function. It has a vulnerability. It's a, fun it's a function in the vulnerability is in the function. That means those variables and arguments are gonna be in the stack. Okay, great, because the stack is not, it's, it's, it's a limited amount, it's not infinite, right? It's a limited am amount of memory, not very big actually. And so given that, and it has a very, um, a very uh, predictable structure usually. 
And so because of that fact that I know the structure, I know the size, I know that it's predictable, and I know that the register will have a pointer to the stack, I know now in terms of rel relative things, like saying, if this is all memory, and you had to, oh, should I try here, or try here, or try here, or try here, that would could take a very long time. But the fact that you know that the CPU is saying, that's the stack. Now you know in terms of relative things, your, your, your space for the attack has grown smaller and it makes it more feasible, okay? So that's the idea there. Okay, so then now you know that and so you, you can zero in on the stack. So another thing that's important is given this variable, or sorry, this C code, we need to think about how that C code gets um, placed in memory. So now we're just going to assume that this is the stack, okay? And we are going to place the information. So obviously there's values in these five things, three arguments and two local variables. So whenever you, you load that function in the stack, you're going to load it in, in always in specific locations. So lock one and all, lock two will be there. This will be followed by some metadata about the function. And then on the other end, you're going to have arguments one, arguments two, argument three, and so on. Does this make sense, guys? So these are, you know, that like this is arc three, right? So that's all I'm saying. When you write the C code, um, you are storing things in specific locations. And so that's what attackers do is that they exploit this well-known thing. That's why I said initially, you're a disgruntled employee from Microsoft. You wrote code for many years there. And by the way, you took the code with you. So you, 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 can, you can analyze it and you can analyze this function. And now you know there's five variables. Okay, there's five variables whenever I load this function. All right, I know the sizes of them. How do you know the sizes? You know, you have the data types, right? And because you have that, okay, then you know, okay, this is gonna be so many bytes. This is so many bytes. And this is the stack frame for my function, let's call this uh, function two, just to say. So, so that's um, the stack frame for function two. Make sense? So whenever the CPU is analyzing this function, it's got a little pointer that says, I am currently on this frame because I am loading function two. But it also needs to know that function two was called from, let's say, function one. And function one is over here. Let's say I'm just going to like really say that's function one. Right? Right there. So the CPU will need to know that, you know, it's going to execute all of this until the end. Once it finishes, you're done. I'm going to abandon the frame for function two. And guess what? The CPU needs to return to the frame for function one. Do you see that, guys? Is this concept clear? Yeah. Yeah, all right, good. Okay, so, uh, so that's an important idea, okay? Um, now, remember that an important uh, way of thinking about this is that the memory is associated with memory addresses. Okay, so we have memory addresses here. And, you know, for instance, they look like this. So 0, X, B, F, F, and F, 3, 2, 3, so hexadecimal. All right, and, but they're basically, you know, that's the address. There. So I've, I keep talking about uh, registers here. So the CPU has a register, it's called It's called um, 
EVP. And that's a register also can be known as the frame pointer. And the frame pointer is basically pointing to that frame or to the other frame, okay? Remember that these frames, again, are associated with um, let's call it the frame is, let's call it the, the, the space, the context for that specific function. So basically we could say this is a frame. In this, as far as the stack is concerned, void function two will need to have its own frame. Every function will need to have its own frame and the CPU is only looking at one frame at a time. Although it keeps track of who, which frame called another frame. So that is to say, um, function one is the one that contains function two. So then function two needs to go back to function one and so on. Okay. All right, so that's you know, our discussion so far. Remember, I have to give you all this intuition because if I don't give you all this intuition, you're not gonna understand what it is that you're doing. But I think now you, you basically know, oh, I have a program and that program is going to be stored in memory, okay? So let's now, uh, before I continue with the format string, I just want to take a break to the, to the lab and just show you the code because I, I showed you this code, right? I showed you this code, but now I want to show you, um, I want to show you, hold on, I want to show you, I need to stop sharing here. Okay, then I need to minimize. I'm looking for the PDF, give me a sec. Okay, so I'm going to open um, Right, I opened the lab, so I'm going to share PDF. Can you guys see the PDF now? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this PDF, this is, this is the PDF for the format string lab. As you can see here in it, it's got a program, just like the one I just showed you, right? I showed you the function one. It's a little program with variables. Vol, now we have this little program here, vol prod C. You're going to have to copy this, uh, this code into your um, terminal and compile it and everything. But if you look at it, it's nothing, it's a main, int main, so it's a function, right? And then it's got printf's, which are functions as well. And then you're gonna have within it a whole bunch of variables. You see that variables, you have arguments, you have, you know, malloc over here, right? You have variables that have values. So you have defined secret one, secret two with these values over here, which are in hex. Um, so you see that these are in hexadecimal, but they're actually numbers if you think about them in decimal. And then you have a, a bunch of print print Fs. You have a scan F. Uh, and over here you have another print F. And you have in particular something very interesting. You have a print F here 
which is a function using something called user input. There, user input. Where user input is something that you get from the user, right? So you, you, you're gonna get, you get two inputs. You see that, you get two inputs, user input and int input, okay? And that basically means that the program will stop and will let you type something and you can type whatever you want. So really what I'm trying to say is that's gonna be how you're going to enter your code injection. Because then that user input goes into the printf, and the printf then is putting, it's a function call which is putting whatever you wrote in user input into memory. And what memory is it putting it in? The stack. Okay, it's going to create a stack frame for you. And so there, there you go. That's that's what this program is about. Some of it is relevant, some of it is irrelevant, but all of those variables are in memory and they're in the same area, right? They're gonna be the arguments and the variables are gonna be in the same stack frame. A stack frame that could also contain addresses of where to jump next or, you know, or something, or next instruction, something like that. And so that, you know, hopefully if, if the lecture today is making sense, you know, in your mind, that should start to tell you things. Oh, I get it. Now, I'm going to enter something. I can't modify the code. So this code is not, you can't modify it. But whoever wrote it made the mistake of not validating this input. You see that? And so you can write whatever you want into it. It gets called into a, a function. It's part of another function. And now you're going to have some access to memory. You see that you're going to have some access to memory. And so, you know, this is, this is a simplified version of what we're going to do later on, but the idea is, is still the same. So in the lab today, as I said, what, or next Thursday, what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to read a value from memory. You're going to try to write gibberish to memory, and then you're going to try to actually write something specific. So that specific thing would be these secrets. Secrets one and two are two things in memory, right, associated with the variable secret here, right? And you're going to want to overwrite them, okay? At least one of them. Uh, and, and that's ultimately You'll be successful in this lab if, for instance, you show me, okay, secret one was 0x44, which is a number. It can also be an ASCII character, like a letter, because, you know, we know the ASCII table. So what I'm going to ask you ultimately is that every student needs to change one of these two parameters, which are a number, to the first letter of their first name. Right, so if your name is Bob, then B, so it should be the ASCII equivalent in hex of the letter B. If your name is Mary, it should be M, and so that, the equivalent of that. That's it, that's literally the entire lab is just that, that that's, the, that's how, you, how you know if you had success, but obviously there's, you know, how do we do it, right? So, because we already know, as I stated, you know, this is code, it's gonna go in the stack, it's gonna go in memory, all that, okay, great. We know we have an input from the user, great, we got that. But, how do we, the problem is, what is that user input need to be, right? You know, you know, it can't just be anything. For you to be successful, you have to follow appropriate sizes, appropriate structure, and appropriate values in them, okay? And so that's really something that's um, pretty important. Are there any questions about this, guys? Okay, no. you guys can hear me, right? All right. 
Okay, so I've stated this, kind of put, put now what I was explaining into context. Now, as it turns out, we're not going to worry about injecting uh, very complex code or addresses. Instead, now this is where the, the words format string come into play. So format string comes into play because um, format string basically, as, as the name states, a string, and we're going to format it. So the printf statement is a place, it's a function rather, I should say in C, that you can use to um, format your outputs, okay? So, so now we're going to fold. So now I've given you the big picture, but now from the rest of the lecture, I'm just going to focus on printf. Now I'm sure you've used it. We use it. It's like, I mean, when you use, when you write it in Python, right? You write print and then you know you can do like format, put a string dot format, and then you put some variables. You know, we know about the percentage S, percentage D. We use those to, to format things. You, you've done that in, in several programming languages, so you understand the idea. Well, now we're going to study some of the properties of the printf function. The printf has a certain behavior that can be exploited to play around with memory a little bit. So this is, that's why this is a, a nice introduction uh, to the idea of manipulating memory. Now, you could do a lot more with uh, printf, you know, more advanced attack. We're not really going to go so deep into it because the buffer overflow lab is really where we're going to cover code injection. So here, I, I just want to keep it simple. I want to kind of like a stepping stone, but have you guys um, play around with memory a little bit, okay? Uh, we're going to have to use the, um, the GCC compiler and the debugger also of C for a lot of this. So I will illustrate at some point, you know, we're going to use GDB um, to get a little bit more insight, okay? Any questions about the code before I move back to the slides? Or the, or the sorry, the whiteboard. Okay, so it seems like there's no questions. So I'm going to do a new share. Go back to the whiteboard. Okay, here we are. Here we are. So now, you know, before I was painting a big picture, right, big picture, now I'm going to focus, as I said, on, we just saw the code, and this is a simple way of getting started with playing with memory. Printf. So what is printf for and all that? So first of all, let's look at its definition. So printf is a function that takes one parameter that's fixed, the const char format, and then it's got these three dots in its definition. And what that implies is that it, it can take a variable length uh, set of um, arguments, okay? So you know, in C, you can do that. Um, and that way you can take more arguments. That has implications to more complicated attacks, et cetera. For our purposes though, uh, I, I'm not gonna go into that detail. I think it, it just makes it too complex. I'm gonna stay with the simpler, clearer picture of this. So what is format string for? So format string is like, you know, in a C program you do print F, ID percentage D, right? And then you might do, you know, new line character and then comma, and you have, let's say, a variable called ID, semicolon. So really the variable ID will be plugged in the percentage D placeholder. These are, these are usually called placeholders. And so what that means is the ID can be in whatever, you know, it's in, you know, it's represented in C, uh, you know, in hex or whatever, but by passing it through a format string, the format string actually um, 
will format it. Now, keep in mind something interesting might be happening here is that ID is someplace in memory with data in it, right? And so really, you have percentage D, percentage D then, when you're printing this out, it's going to print whatever's in there, right? And then once it's done, you know, you have the question, what might happen next? Well, if you think about it, what if you had <coughs> this scenario? ID percentage D age percentage D <coughs> like that. So in that case, now you have two format strings. So that means you need two parameters. So you have ID and age, right? You see that? So in memory now, you have ID, let's say age over here. You have whatever is controlling the flow of this printf. So printf is currently, let's say pointing there in the frame. You read percentage D, you read this data. What should printf do now? Well, there's two parameters actually. So move the pointer to the next one. And then that's going to be that percentage D and you print it. But if you notice what might happen here is with this idea is that you are able to advance the pointer in memory. You literally moved it from one place in memory to another. Now, granted it's a structured way but that's something that's now, now you have a certain ability there that somehow these little things, they're acting like a type of a command that are actually moving so that you can read the variables in memory. Does that make sense guys? Any questions? No questions, it seems. Uh, so let's look, you know, let's just uh, do a complete example of that. So I have, you know, curly bracket, curly bracket. And I'm going to do int ID 1000, int age 25, char name. Notice this is an address to another place in memory where you would have Bob Smith. Okay, and so now you have a printf statement. Printf takes in id percentage d name percentage s uh, age percentage D and so here we need name age right because we have three we need to have a correspondent right ID name oops age right now what about if I specify three here, but I forget one, you see that? What's the danger there? If we're not careful, remember that printf has this capability to just move in memory. So we gave it this, we gave it that. 
and it may not know where to go for the third one. So it might read an address that's not correct and crash. Okay. So again, these are, these are just the ideas that we're exploring, right? That this ability to move in memory, this, 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 the fact that the variables are kind of stored together and the fact that the printf acts strangely with these format strings. So notice I mentioned here percentage D, percentage S. So there, there are in fact several of these. So I'm gonna give you some of, these are called the format parameters. Format parameters. And we have percentage D, percentage X, percentage S, percentage N. Okay, I think there's a few more actually, but just these we can focus on. So the meaning of them is that this is decimal. This one is hex. This one's string. Now, Sometimes when you are formatting, the people that created the function wanted to know because, you know, for whatever reason, honestly, they wanted to know how many characters they had printed out so far, given the input, the formatting, everything, the combination. And so percentage N actually does something interesting. It gives you, it, it, it works very strangely, but it gives you the number of bytes written so far. And it actually, it, it's, it's, it's use is something like this. N and I believe, you know, something like that. So it gives you, it usually writes this to a specific address that you can specify. And so if you don't write, if you don't code this correctly, I, I, if I remember the syntax correctly, I'm not, actually that syntax is, I don't want to do something. Um, what is that? I had it in here somewhere, but I can't find it. But anyway, it's not really that important. It, it, it is something, I can't remember exactly what it is, but I'll have to look, look at look for it. Um, so the idea is that it writes the number of bytes written so far to a specific place in memory. So think about what I'm saying there. This can write something and it can write to a place in memory. So now you have two additional things that you can, as an as a, as a, as a exploit person, you can think, huh, you know what? I can print certain numbers and I actually can write to memory as well. So maybe I should look into that. Okay. All right, so we talked about this. Did I give you the program? Yeah, I gave you the program already. Good. All right. Good, good, good. We're making good progress. So then, um, kind of to summarize format string, we know that if we, for instance, did this printf and we just gave it percentage s, percentage s, percentage s, so on, dot, 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 printf will somehow start looking for things to write because it's looking for the parameters that follow after, right? If you don't provide any, all it's going to do is it's, it's designed to look for things in memory because they're supposed to be arguments and that's it where it's supposed to find them, right? And so if you don't provide these, in essence, what you're doing is you're just adv advancing the pointer in the stack in memory and you're reading whatever's in there, regardless of you writing it or not. 
So ultimately, you might be reading gibberish things. And so that's what you're going to play with in this lab is, is you know, that mechanism to see what you can access in memory. OK? So percentage reads from the stack, so percentage S reads from the stack, OK? Another way of saying this is that every percentage S reads a frame from the stack. So given that, how do you crash a program? So how do you crash a program? So it might might turn out that when it's when you the frame is it's got a limited size, right? It's got a limited size. So at first you start reading with these percentage s's, and there might be some values in there that you can read, values you provided, etc. But eventually, though, you might go out into a space beyond the stack. And you read an address, you read that whatever is in memory there, thinking it's some kind of a memory, uh, an address or something. It's not an address or a value. Um, and so it crashes. So maybe I should say that percentage D reads by value, percentage X reads by value. Whereas percentage S reads by reference. Okay, and so what that means is that if you have a percentage S, what are you looking for? So let, let's say actually, if you have a percentage D, I'm gonna give you guys this question. If I have a percentage D, what am I gonna read here? How am I gonna treat the data Let's say I read this. What am I going to do with that data? How am I going to use it? If percentage D reads by value. I think it's going to try to convert it to a value, right? That's right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to think it's a value and treat it that way. So whatever is in there, it's going to try to print out. Do you see that? So to crash it, you just need to reference something that is the opposite of the, the, ref, the, the value or, you know, whether it's a string value. Not necessarily, I mean, not necessarily because... Uh, all that these things do is that they treat whatever is in there as something. So if percentage D reads by value, so if percentage D reads by value, think about it. Whatever hex is here is going to print it out. It's going to print it out on the screen. However, percentage S does not read by value, according to my notes, right? What does percentage S do? So percentage S reads by reference. Uh, so if there is no reference there, then you might crash it then, right? Well, it's a, it's a good way of putting it. So, so let's just, uh, I think you, you're on the right track. Let's just think about it. So hello, right? Hello is here in memory. This is an address. You see that? That's an address pointing to that hello. So when percentage S treats something by reference, it's going to think this is an address and I'm going to go to the place where this is and hopefully there's something there. Do you see that? Yeah. Percentage D on the other hand does not look for something in memory. Instead, it's going to take whatever is in here. So for instance, let's say that I have an address in here. I have the address um, 
417. And that's the address for this, 417. I really want to get what that address is. Well, use a percentage D, it's going to print out that address for you. And in, in particular, if you do it in uh, hex, that's the way addresses are in memory anyway. So it'll allow you to see the addresses in memory. You understand? Yeah. This is pretty important, guys, because solving, you know, using those correctly will allow you to get addresses, will allow you to get the values. And that's how you're going to know, oh, where is, first of all, you, you need to find those two values, those secrets, right? So which one of these should you use for those secrets? X, right? X, which ones are X? X, X, X. Y, X. Because that would be the value of a hex, like a hex value. It, right, it might give you the hex value of it. Yeah, very good, Ex excellent. Right, um, and, and so exactly, exactly, very good. Now, if you wanted to find some, let's say your name, one of the problems that I'm going to give you is, um, I need to figure this out, but that was Susanna, right? So let's say Susanna, you wrote your name on there. Well, if you wrote your name on there, the variable that holds your name is probably somewhere in memory. And here, all you have is a address, right? You have an address. So the first thing you want to do is probably get that address, percentage X, print it out as a hex. Now you have the address and now find a function in, 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 the, in the debugger that allows you to print whatever's in that address. And then you found your name, print it out. Do you see that? Guys? Yes. Do you understand the difference? It, you know, this little thing, this little, like, it, I would almost say this little column in this table that's buried in here is extremely important. Understanding the difference between value, by ref, um, you know, percentage D, percentage X, percentage S. You know, this is the one thing that will allow you to be successful in this lab because you need to figure out when you read to read things by value, when you need to read things by reference, when you use the percentage D, percentage X, percentage S, percentage N, all of these, by the way, read. This one writes, interestingly, and it writes to a specific, to a place in memory. And so that is, you know, dangerous. Okay. Any good questions, all great questions. Any other uh, questions there? Okay, so don't forget that table. I would just, uh, oh. yeah, I would just print out that table when you're doing your lab because it'll help you. I provided another table that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, yeah, okay, good. So I think I've, I've said that. Let me share. Let me I need to stop sharing. And then I need to. Okay, so you should be seeing the ASCII table now, right? The ASCII table here. Um, so this ASCII table, as you can see, it's got decimals, hex, and characters. Remember that the task will be, you know, if your name is Mary, okay, you need to find the letter M, right? And that's going to be hex 60, decimal 109, that value, those two secrets, secret one and secret two, you need to change them to M, which basically means that you will need to figure out how to write 6D into that space. Now, keep in mind, there might be a little trick. 
and percentage n gives you the number of characters printed out so far, right? So you can say, for instance, okay, I'm gonna print out, I printed out 20, 60 for Mary is 109. Okay, so 20 minus 109 is uh, 89? Yeah, 89. Yeah, 89. And so figure out a way to print out more characters. If you print out 89 more characters, then now percentage N is 109. That's a decimal. If you put that in secret one or secret two, 109, you know, the representation inside the computer is always the same, you know, so whether it was decimal or, or hex, you know, percentage N is 109 is 60, which basically is M. So when you print what's in those two variables, it'll print out M and therefore you were successful. So keep in mind that for you to accomplish that specific task, you have to do a whole bunch of other tasks just to learn the ropes. Usually, you know, with labs, it's always like that, right? There's only one main thing. Uh, but you need then to understand, okay, things are in memory, variables are in memory. I already know there's secret one and secret two in that bulk prod. I know that the only way that I can uh, change it is by adding uh, my variables um, through the input, through the user provided input while the program is running. I'm going to exploit this mechanism. We're not even exploiting, you know, like, like many things right now from uh, buffer overflow labs. We're just exploiting this idea that printf will have the, the parameters in memory. We've established that these percentage format strings, S's can move in the stack. <laughs> Every time we use one, we move. And so therefore, we have, um, we can move. So we can move through them and then we can do things in it, right? Like read values. We've established that we can read addresses. We can read, you know, because we can read by value or by reference. And we, we have established that we have percentage and to write things. So it's really, you know, it's like a game. You just have to now craft an approach using all these elements and your understanding of what's happening behind the scenes to really um, be successful in your approach. Okay, so I think that's everything I wanted to say about that. Um, so I, you know, so do you have questions? Okay, no questions. Okay, so going back to the idea, how do you crash a program? Well, what if you start using these percentage X's, percentage S's, right? You start using them. So Yash, I think, you know, that was his question. Um, so I have percentage S and I go there and there's a valid address. I read it in memory. Does the program crash? No. No, exactly. It does not. Very good answer. So it does not crash. All right. But, but I know that the second I, I did that percentage S, the frame pointer, so I, should, I should not have this there. Percentage S is the command, right? But there's a pointer. And we read the first one, it didn't crash. Now, because of percentage S, we move to the next one. We read it. If there's a valid address in there, because we're reading by percentage S, which is by reference, it finds another valid address. It reads whatever's in there. It could be gibberish, but does it crash? No. no, no, exactly. And then, so here's the trick because I'm giving you the solution to one of the problems in the lab. As you start writing percentage S's, percentage S's, what's going to happen? The frame is limited to only a certain amount. 
What happens if it goes here? Oh, that's still in the frame. Let's see. Let's see. There. This one is not part of the frame. It's actually a place in memory that may have at some point stored your, your video game information that you have. And what's left in there is a bunch of characters that are not memory. Because remember, you know, a combination of numbers there can be pretty large, but memory is limited. So you don't have infinite space, which means you don't have an infinite number of address spaces. Does that make sense? You know, you don't have a, an infinite, no, you only have a, a finite and actually quite finite, very limited uh, set. You know, it's like, this is the infinite amount of addresses that you have in the world and in, 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 in the universe, right? The, the possible number of addresses for the whole universe, your computer is that point there, right? And so it, it's gonna, it, it's gonna happen more than likely that you're going to find an address and that address is what? Does not exist in your memory. So at that point, by reference, percentage S will read that address and it'll go to nowhere. And what will happen then? And the system will crash. It'll crash, exactly. Very good. So in, in, in conclusion, more percentage S's, the better. Now you don't have to give it 40 percentage S's. Play with it one, two, three, you know, until you figure out the appropriate amount of percentage S's until you crash the program. At that point, you will also know things by doing that. You will know the size of the, of, of the frame. And that gives you an idea. Okay. So you'll know in this space somewhere are my variables. And now I just need to figure out where they are. I'm going to use my by values and my by refs to get addresses, to get the strings themselves, to get decimals and I can find things. Now, one, one important thing is, if you only do it like this, like I wrote percentage S's here, initially you can. When you're not trying to read data, you don't care, fine, don't use it. But when you're actually trying to distinguish, because remember that the, these formats move from frame to frame, so, or, or, or from little spaces in the frame. So it's real, literally like it's moving from variable one to variable two to variable three. It's printing things as hex. So if you just write, you know, let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, right? If you see it like that, you know, oh, that's three variables. But if you print all of it like this, How do you know where does one variable begin and the other variable end? You don't, right? Especially if all of this is almost like random characters in hexadecimal. One little trick for that is just put a period in between the percentage S's. So what's gonna happen is your output will look like that. And there, boom, you have your, you know which, okay, you'll be like, oh, this is one for sure. I'm going to use the decimals to figure out which ones are numbers. I have my ASCII table so I can translate those secret numbers that are in hex into decimals and you'll know where they are and so on. Got it? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so every so we talked about this. We talked about how to crash it. So I've already told you that. Talked about readings, invalid spaces, invalid memory addresses. Talked about that. Good. So we're doing good. I have to give you uh, more code or more uh, commands on. So on Thursday, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use the GDB compiler uh, in, 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 in Linux. That's actually pretty handy. It's still a terminal based, but it's actually pretty powerful. Mm. Okay, so that we're gonna do on Thursday. So that pretty much. So I guess I'm just gonna do now a summary. 
because I really at this point laid out the theory, if you will. I've given you hopefully uh, a mental picture in your mind of, of how things work. And now it's just a matter of showing you the commands, you know, for compiling, running the program, running um, GDB. So that you can so so the, the advantage of GDB is it's like in Visual Studio, you put that breakpoint, right? You know, you run your program in, in like an execution for debugging, but you put the breakpoint in, so it's gonna load some variables in memory and then halt at the breakpoint, and then you can see what's in memory. So GDB is pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> and so you will use that. Okay, so format string vulnerability. It's a type of vulnerability that can be used in security exploits. As I said, we're not going to go to the most advanced um, things that you can do with it. We're just going to keep it simple just for the um, intuition. They can be used to crash programs or you know, even execute harmful code. Although we're not going to do that, we're going to do executing harmful code on the next lab, which is the buffer overflow. Um, the problem stems from the use of unchecked user input, input validation. As, I, as I've said a couple of times, the control is input validation. Okay, we've talked about the key place is the printf statement and that's actually um, highlighted in the in the code itself right and the code says oh yeah by the way this is the vulnerability uh, format strings um, so a malicious user may use the characters like percentage s percentage x percentage n, which are format tokens. Uh, to print data from the stack or possibly other locations in memory. You can also write arbitrary data to the arbitrary locations using the percentage as format. So again, you're gonna do that. If your name is Mary, you need to figure out a way in those secrets, secret one, secret two. I can't remember what letters they have right now. I believe one is a U, uppercase U, the other one's an uppercase D. If I remember from the lab, those are the letters. Uh, you can check the ASCII table and then it'll show you what they are. But I believe that's what they are. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's it. That's the, that's the, um, the theory on the lab. And then all that's left is understanding how to, how to do this lab on, on Wednesday or sorry, on Thursday. Are there any questions at this time? Guys, anything? No, I don't no, think sir, so. No, sir, I'm all good. It's all clear, wow. It's pretty impressive. Okay. Um, yeah, so the problem is I don't wanna get into the lab details and then just cut it off. Um, so let me just give you, let me just do this. What do you need to do? How do you get started with that lab without having to read, you know, a ton of material? I showed you that in the, I showed you that in the PDF, the code is given. I think I already closed. Let me, let me reopen that. Here it is. So 
in the in the program, you really have that code. The one that says vol proxy, you'll need to copy that. So you can see it's not that long. And just read it, spend some time reading it, become familiar with it, then compile it. You're going to use the GCC compiler. And then once you've compiled it, compiled it, run it. Okay, that's what you're going to do. Remember, it's going to ask you for an input. Okay, so that's pretty much what you have to do. So So then, kind of to summarize it, I guess, you have to you know, get, uh, um, get the code, type the code, right? It, you know, it's going to be called volprog.c, for instance. Let's call it that. Then after that, you're going to need to compile it. And the way you compile it is in the GCC. GCC dash G dash O vol frog. And that's the name of the output executable. And then the input is vol. Oops. Vol frog dot C. Okay. Then after that, it's executable, right? So you can run it. So you run it. And then when you run it, it's going to basically then prompt you. It's, I, I don't remember what it says, but it, I think there's two prompts. One says, enter an integer. You'll enter an integer. Then it says, enter a string. You'll enter a string and so on, right? So you have to figure out which one of those is the vulnerability and where you should start entering things. So then after you're, you're in, a, in the entering position, remember, it's the input that goes to the printf. So then if you want to crash it, oops, dot, 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 right? So you got to figure that out. That's like the easiest thing right there. Just getting that done. It's kind of a warm up. You know, you basically compiled it and you, you kind of prove to yourself that if you read past the frame in memory, you crash the program. Then after that, we will need to use the GDB compiler. So that in Linux looks like this. All right, and from there, we'll be able to run commands like run uh, break. And we can insert a break on line 29. So you got to figure out on what line of the code you want to stop things. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. But really, if you want to start with the lab, this gets you to completing the first task up until here. Okay, that gets you to complete that task uh, effectively. All right, so I think this is a good stopping point. Um, I will kind of pick up from here on Thursday uh, so that we can go over the lab. And then after that, hopefully, you'll be able to solve both of those labs pretty easily. All right. So at this point, are there any questions? Not as of right now. All right. Great, great. So I'll see you guys on Thursday, and we will stop here for today. Thank you, Professor. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a nice night, Professor. Good night. Hi, Professor. Yes. Well, I have a question about my assignment this week. Okay. I'll just, what, what will we to submit this week? You Thursday? just submit um, a lab report. So it's got to have you know, you address the questions and you provide screenshots of what you just you the PDF or the PDF document or Word document is fine. Windows, so something oh. that I can I, open. I, I, I mean, the the schedule ID folder have two have two document. One is PDF name schedule ID. The document you only have to do for the for the set UID and the format string. 
you only need to do what's in the Word document. The, the, so the other one, the PDFs are for, for reading, but the only thing you have to do is answer the questions that I wrote in the Word document. So the two question or, or the 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. Yes, the full Word, um, in the, it, it, yeah, these first two labs, I've made them that way. I, I change them a little every now and then. Uh, oh. And so, but, the, but it's the same idea. It's just, you know, so it's not always the same thing. So ju just, the, just the full question? It's everything. So everything in the Word document. So everything oh, in the Word document associated with the set UID module, everything in the Word document um, associated with the format string module. Okay, okay, Santaga. So how, how, how can I submit it just through the- will, I will create a Dropbox on uh, what, uh, uh, a drop whatever on Brightspace. So uh, you'll, in the module, you will see a link and, and you'll be able to, I haven't created it yet, yet. Okay, okay. So it will create it in the Thursday this week? That's right, in Thursday in class, because it's gonna be due by then, um, I will create something for you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. I'll see you Thursday. See you Thursday. Bye. Bye.